And tonight on The Daily Wrap, Donald Trump continues to move ahead of the pack as Hillary faces a downhill slide. Is it now time for Joe Biden to jump in the race? The head of the DNC proves once again that a degree in political science is not necessary in order to be the head of the party. Support for President Obama's Iran deal is dwindling. And would you like to see Ann Coulter be Donald Trump's press secretary? We talk about that and much, much more live from New York City. And welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Joe Conta, joined by my co-host, Rick Unger, who will also be part of the Trump candidate, uh, cabinet at this point, I'm thinking, since well, I we, mean, got if Coulter, Coulter we got Coulter, can Palin. be. I think I can be. You, you think so? I don't think that's asking too much, right. do you? Done deal. What are we talking about tonight? Let's see. Oh, Big we topic. Got a lot, you know, for August, I said this time and time again, mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by the vice president. I really am. I think that'll be uh, a big part of tonight's conversation and a big part of the conversation for the week to come. It's been dominating the news all day, no yeah. question. And to Mr. Unger's right, she's America's pundit and a Philly attorney. <laughs> and apparently... <laughs> Up there. A very engaging weekend that for Miss Hanson. Engaging weekend. Thank Congratulations. <laughs> what people want to know, we're just going to hijack this segment with this stuff right now. Will you become your, uh, can we say his name? Sure. But Heather I, Leibowitz? Or will no, you no, stay no, Heather Lieberman. Hansen? She's gonna Lieberman. Be, <laughs> I keep doing that. <laughs> She's going to be Heather Hansen, reporter John. I'm going to be always okay. be Heather yeah. Hansen. Always and forever be Heather Hansen. <laughs> yeah, just don't hyphenate that. If you're like Hansen. Reporter John. Lieberman. That's a long name <laughs> to put on a check. Anyway, congratulations. I predicted much. this would happen Thank you, on you the did. sixth try. You did. And finally, <laughs> Forbes.com columnist and Emmy winner. He is also married as well. His name is Bill Tucker. That's Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Let's Glad see your ring. Twin ear. Oh, there it's beautiful. Yes. Got our ring. Coin yeah. edge. Classic <laughs> ring. They all look the same. All right, everybody. Let's get right to the daily download. <laughs> Leibowitz. It's Lieberman. Anyway, we're starting to feel like a broken record here at The Wrap. It's Monday, and there is another national poll that reveals Donald Trump is crushing his competition. In the latest Monmouth University poll, the Donald takes a two-to-one lead over Jeb Bush, add it all up, and Trump has gained 13 points in two weeks. Here's some interesting points from the poll. Trump leads Walker 27 to 16 percent among very conservative voters, has 22 percent support among conservative voters to 14 percent for Bush and 12 percent for Walker and takes 28 percent of moderate to liberal voters compared to 20 percent for Bush. Rick, across ideology lines, Mr. Trump <laughs> is winning. He, it just keeps, you know what we thought? We thought that the McCain thing was going to hurt and apparently the man is Teflon. Well, first of all, let's, let's be a little bit careful here. Mm -hmm. For starters, when we say across ideological groups, we're talking within the Republican Party. Yes. There's about three liberal Republicans left in the country, so I, I, I'm <laughs> not sure that that speaks. The other thing, too, that I think we have to be a little bit careful about, yes, in this poll, the Monmouth poll, he's, he's rocking. Uh, but when you look at the average of polls, he's definitely still in the lead. Mm -hmm. But you see him much closer within the margin of error lead between uh, Mr. Trump and then Walker and, uh, and Bush. So, you know, we're at that stage. Obviously, this is a very big week. It is. The debate's going to tell us a lot. Let's share some more numbers, shall we? Let's talk about the Tea Party. Tea Party supporters back Trump 35% over Walker's 15% and Cruz at 11%. Non-Tea Party supporters split their top support between Trump at 20 and Bush at 16. Bill, Trump is the Tea Party approved candidate apparently as well. <laughs> Your thoughts? But, but again, it's 15 months. I mean, I'm tempted to not put a, I'm tempted to put a modifier in front of 15 months. But if this is a stock, it just keeps going up. It is, up. but it's interesting yeah. too. And, 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 and well, the trend, the, trend, the trend is your friend until it's not anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Ed Rollins posted something really interesting this weekend. Uh, he, he said that the rest of the candidates in this race should take a lesson from Donald Trump because he speaks bluntly and then he doesn't backtrack back to the McCain thing. He never apologized for the McCain thing. It made his numbers go up. And I think pe in, in Ed's point was people are looking for somebody who's refreshing like that who won't go, oh gee gosh, I kind of misspoke, but just stands by what this is. Even when he misspeaks. Yeah. Heather, right. we, yeah. we saw uh, an example of that today where they asked him uh, about taxes. 
and how and he said you know what? I want to pay as little as possible. Yeah. I want to avoid paying tax as much as possible, which is different from Romney, who kind of, I don't want to say danced around the issue, but seemed to be embarrassed about it as well. Right. Trump says, I'm rich, I don't care, and I don't want to give the government any of my money. He's not a politician, and that is what I think people like. He doesn't say things because he thinks that it's what people want to hear. He doesn't backtrack because he thinks that's what people want to hear. Except and that he, he is saying exactly what he knows people want to hear. But I don't think he's being disingenuous when he talks about not wanting to pay taxes. No, I don't, I don't think, either. I don't think there's, I don't I think think there's so very either. little about what he says that is disingenuous. That it happens to be what people want to hear, I think, is interesting. It yeah. may say a lot about what the Republican Party wants from their next president. It, it may have something to do with a source that told me that he was backstage at a Trump thing and was speaking to Trump, and Trump said, so what does this crowd want to hear? And he told him. And Trump said, well, that's what I'll say. Yeah. yeah. So, his, his so message has been pretty consistent. Yeah. I mean, look, it's it's not about his message. It's He doesn't have a message yet. What he has is a style. Style. And he has a style that's definitely appealing to a segment of the population. I continue to point out, because I think it's only reasonable, add up all the rest of those people, and Trump's only got what 20 some percent it, you know, we're not going to know look you got to give him credit i give him credit he has far exceeded what i thought he yeah. would do yeah. but when but when this thing starts to narrow and it will he'll probably still be there i'll give him that mm -hmm. okay. but you're going to see a real switch yeah, and just a quick, quick, quick note of style you know rick if we had a democrat come out and have that same style yeah. it would be his winning i think we're I just agree. looking for that democrats yeah. have manners right. and who knows we may get that <laughs> candidate that which we'll talk about <laughs> in a little bit but first how does voters' age play into the election? Well, Trump has 26% and a clear lead over Bush at 15% and Walker 12% among voters aged 50 or older. Those under 50% also prefer Trump at 26 to Walker's 10 and Bush at 9. He seems to be liked by everybody, Heather, just quickly. I mean, we've seen that. We've seen that within our own audience. You know, they're big fans of Trump. We saw it in the polls that you guys have taken on the streets, where you see a lot of young men especially who seem to be drawn to him. A lot of that, I think, is the TV thing. He already has a personality that people know. Right, exactly. He doesn't really have to define himself. But if he was liked by everybody, he wouldn't have 26%. He'd have 100%. That's true. But then again, no. he's not like We have everybody. the tape that says he would not exceed, what you say, about 14%. Well, and 15. we also have the tape. We also have the tape where Mr. <laughs> Trump told us that he would win the Latino vote. Are we going to oh, be discussing boy. that poll? Okay, you're one for two. It has been reported that both GOP heads, uh, head, his name is uh, Reince. Yes. You like to say that, Rick. Let Reince. me get your Reince. 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 Yes. And Fox News owner Rupert Murdoch have been critical, but that seems to be changing. Two weeks ago, Rupert Murdoch tweeted the following. Fox Thursday debate, vital for all candidates. If Trump gets through unscathed, it will be a big win. Time for all to understand his support. That's very interesting because Mr. Murdoch had a very different perspective on Donald Trump just a couple weeks ago. Is this Trump support forcing mainstream Republicans to rethink their position on him being in the race? Trump was asked about this on Meet the Press if he was preparing for Thursday's debate. Well, I'm not a debater. I don't, I've never debated before. I've never been on a stage debating. I guess my whole life has been a debate in one way, but I've never been on a formal stage debating. So I really don't know. I understand you have nine other people that are going to be shooting at me, and that may be true, maybe not. But I, I really don't know. I, I don't have pollsters. I don't want to waste money on pollsters because, you know, they, I don't want to be unreal. I want to be me. I have to be me. Bill, he's definitely lowballing us, that's for sure. Here, here's, the, here's the interesting part, that if you attack Trump, if you're one of the other nine candidates, yeah. then you're drawing attention to him again. I, I think the goal of those nine candidates is to not make it about Donald, but at the same time get the necessary jabs in yeah. on him. That's a very delicate dance. It is a very delicate dance, but why don't they just take the lesson? He gave them the blueprint. Why don't they just get up there and start speaking their minds, start not taking back what they say, and they'll be on the road to catching up with this guy who's just, who's late. It's not like a secret here. Rick, do you think this will be a turning point for Donald Trump, whether it be up or down this debate, or you think I don't know. You know, to me, the only real question that matters is John Stewart's leaving that night. The debates on that night, which show will be funnier? Well, <laughs> Either question. way, that will be one of the highest rated nights ever yeah. for an August in cable uh, news history. I wrote about today on Media. Anyway, big media and critics say Donald Trump isn't prepared to take over the White House. Well, as you can see by our numbers, a growing, growing number say he is. In fact, 
He wrote a whole book outlining exactly what he would do as president. It's called Time to Get Tough. The bestseller details Donald Trump's plan for our southern border, China terrorism, and much, much more. If you want to learn more about Trump's plan, check it out or go to Newsmax.com slash Trump book and get your free offer. That's right. You can get the best-selling book, Time to Get Tough, for free. Go to Newsmax.com slash Trump book. More Daily Wrap in just a moment. It's going to start sinking into Democrats that despite good speeches and despite lots of bravado, Hillary Clinton is a disaster. She's a disaster because of <laughs> corruption. She's a disaster because of arrogance. I mean, what, what Trump said was right. We're, we're if, just about a, <laughs> well, you know, you, you look, but you look at how they treated General Petraeus, and you look at what she did with her emails, and in uh, any other circumstance, she'd be going to jail, not the White House. <laughs> And welcome back to The Daily Wrap. That, of course, was Newt Gingrich appearing yesterday on ABC's This Week. And while I don't know if jail is in Mrs. Clinton's future, Hillary is facing considerable pressure as she continues to trend downward in the polls. Indeed, with congressional investigations looming and union support unclear, Secretary Clinton may be opening the door to a few new candidates on the Democratic side. Here's what Mark Stein had to say while appearing with Neil Cavuto on Fox News. Uh, Hillary, I think, is a terrible candidate. She's got, she's got all the money, she's got all the cronies, but she herself is a stiff and a bore. And uh, Democrats uh, like a romance. Apparently it's not just uh, Trump that can be rather direct in his assessment of people. All right, Joe, I mean, is Hillary's personality at the heart of her problems or is it something else? It's at the heart of her problems, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, she is untrustworthy, but she's just so stiff and I agree with Mark, so phony. Remember she went out to, down to South Carolina and said, I've been coloring my hair for years. Yeah, and she, she does did. the same speech in New York and then the accent completely changes. There's just something unlikable about her. Yeah, you know, I can't deny that that's true. Heather, you know, look, I mean, people who I know who know Hillary well, to a person say she's a very nice woman, mm -hmm. sense of humor, the whole thing, but you don't see it no. when she goes out and campaigns. Can a person be elected president of the United States if they can't show their inner warmth? I, I mean, we'll find out, right? But I don't think so. I think that you've got to have charisma. People have to like you to want you to be president, to elect you to be president. She does not have her husband's charisma. And to get over the untrustworthiness problem, she has to have something, some kind of warmth. I think it explains why people say that she doesn't uh, feel for them and their problems, because she just doesn't come across as a caring, as a caring person. person. So, Bill, I mean, that may well be true, but isn't that putting the, the presidency of the United States or running for it on a par with running for a high school student council? <laughs> You know, it's who you like. Done, right? Come on, let's quit pretending. It's really like true, isn't it? It's enterprise. really <laughs> true. <laughs> we, I, I, I set you up with the question because I agree with you on the answer. When we vote for presidents, we do it based on do you want to have a beer with that person? Yeah, do you like them? I mean, her problem's magnified by the fact that she's married to the single most charming politician of our time. Right. That man, that man could do and has done anything and gotten away with it. But it and Hasn't everybody's totally like, he's a really nice it. guy. All right. you know, while Bernie Sanders has captured a lot of attention and a lot of Democratic love, many believe he will not be able to topple Clinton as the top vote getter in the primaries. So here's the big question. Has the time come now to consider Vice President Joe Biden and maybe a few others as contenders? While the vice president hasn't been forthcoming about any serious interest in the 2016 race, today we see that Josh Alcorn, one of Bo Biden's former senior advisors and top fundraisers, has joined the PAC dedicated to drafting Biden. Now, many insiders are saying that this is a pretty big sign. We also heard yesterday via an article in the New York or Washington Post, I'm sorry, that uh, Bo Biden's dying wish was that his father run for president. So, Heather. Is Uncle Joe going to jump into the race? What do you think? Listen, I hope so. I like him. I think he'd be a better president than Hillary. He's got 36 years in the Senate. He's known for reaching across the aisle, which is something that we need right now. But he has an uphill battle. He's got to deal with the fact that he hasn't raised a whole lot of money. Hillary's raised $46 million. He has to deal with the fact that many of his top aides went to Hillary's campaign with the assumption... That is, it is a problem. I mean, it, 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 it shouldn't be late. But it is, late. it is late. A lot of a lot of the supporters that Biden has in terms of staff, in terms of money, they have already committed. Can you get them back? All things that could be fixed. 
and quite frankly, you can get message out a lot better now with social media and the fact that I, I just don't think that that grassroots sort of campaign is as important as it used to be. Bernie Sanders is showing that he doesn't have any money and not much of a staff, and look what he's doing Except alone. Except that Bernie Sanders isn't. You know, we're all impressed by the the campaign that Bernie Sanders has put on. He's been great. But none of us believe he's going to win enough primaries to get the nomination. But Joe Biden could do that. Well, I think Joe absolutely. Biden could. But it's not just Joe Biden, because this weekend again in the New York Times, columnist Maureen Dowd said that Howard Schultz, the chairman and CEO of Starbucks, is also being urged to challenge Hillary Clinton for the Democratic presidential nomination. Now, Schultz is a rags to riches story in America. While he did gain some negative notoriety during his Race Together campaign at Starbucks, that kind of flopped, mm -hmm. uh, he does have the respect of corporate America and caffeine addicts like me everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, you take this one first. Is sure. this the Democratic Trump? Is this somebody who we should also be taking seriously? It's a sign, Rick, that support for Hillary Clinton among Democrats is so soft. They are begging for somebody else to run. I haven't heard of Schultz even being considered before this, but now they're trying to draft people. Joe, you run. Howard, you run. Someone, you run, because we want anybody but Hillary Clinton. Yeah, I don't know, Heather. It's I've, I've actually heard the name bandied about. Yeah, and, you know, with I the Race too, Together actually. thing, and then he had that other program going on right now where he's got young people getting jobs. It's He is a lot like Trump. He said, is he the Democratic Trump? Mm -hmm. He is not a politician. He believes in what he says. I think that it, you know, we've sat at this table and said, who else is there? It may be someone from the private sector like this who's going to step up? Is it, uh, is Look, it, is it guy, Schultz for president? I don't know. The guy could get people to pay $5 for a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that quite a few that people. To, quite quite a few exactly. people. He speaks to himself. Uh, it's, you, know? It's, you know, the one thing everybody seems to agree on is there's going to have to be more candidates coming into the Democratic. It would make it, it interesting. It would, it would make, make it fun. Sense. But, you know, with all of this talk, we can't forget Hillary is so far ahead I don't know if it can be done, but we'll see. What do you think? Should the vice president enter the race? Should Howard Schultz from Starbucks enter the race? Does there need to be more candidates? Go to NewsmaxTV.com slash comments to let us know. And coming up, we're going to talk again about Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who can't tell us the difference between Democrats and Socialists. And welcome back to Daily Wrap. Let's check in with the Lord of the Manor, Steve Malsberg, and see what he's preparing for us tonight. Joe, the murder rates are up in big cities all over the country. We'll let you hear what a judge said to an illegal accused of murder. You're not going to want to miss that. Also, Trump leading the polls still, and Obama sicking the EPA on all of us. We'll get Tom DeLay's reaction to that. John Sununu is here. Two panels. It's all coming up next. I like the jacketless Steve Malsberg. Yeah. That man's in shape. Fit, man. He yeah, cast, but <laughs> yeah, no, he does stay in shape. He That's does, true. doesn't he? Yeah. Okay. He does. All right. Enough about Malsberg. Remember this Ooh. little nugget from DNC Chairman Debbie Wasserman Schultz just last week. Well, what is the difference between the a Democrat game? and a Socialist? <laughs> uh, I used to think there was a big difference. What do you think it is? The difference between the Democrat, like Hillary the, Clinton, the and socialist like Bernie Sanders. What's the difference between uh, being a Democrat and being a Republican? Well, what's the bigger difference? What's the big difference between a Democrat and a socialist? You're the chairman of the Democratic Party. Tell me the difference between you and a socialist. The the relevant debate that we'll be having over the course of this this campaign is what's the difference between a Democrat a big and a Republican? I think there's a huge difference. And the, de has... the difference between a Democrat and Republican is that Democrats fight to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to succeed, and the Republicans are strangled by their right wing extremists. Oh, God, I could watch that again <laughs> oh, and again. Painful. You know I what it was painful. like? Painful. I find it painful. In the beginning, when she is being asked that question and the wires begin to, you yeah. know, to just decompose, she looks like Rachel Dolezal when they asked her, are you an African-American? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was good stuff. So... It's a couple days later. Debbie has to gather herself, read over some notes, because she's going to go on national TV on Meet the Press and probably will be asked that same question again. So did the DNC head learn from her mistake? Let's take a look. What is the difference? Can you explain the difference? You know, Chuck, it's always fun to be interviewed by Chris Matthews, and, uh, and I know that he enjoys that banter. The important distinction that I think we're going to be discussing, I'm, I'm confident we'll be discussing in this campaign, is the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Zero point zero. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> you, you gotta go with Dean Wormer there. When you, you, zero point zero on this. Are you kidding me? Rutro, she still doesn't know the answer. This woman is the head of the Democratic National Committee. Chris Matthews gave Deborah Washington Schultz a little schooling on the answer. She doesn't want to answer that question. Yeah, Why do you think, think that? I, well, I think there's a big difference. I mean, uh, uh, socialists traditionally believe in government control of the economy, and Democrats believe in modifying the economy to help people at the bottom, a safety net, modification, but clearly they believe in the market. Why do you think she didn't say that? Well, politically, she doesn't want to offend the Bernie people. You think that's the issue? Well, I think so. I, maybe there was an intellectual problem, but I, I will give her the benefit of the doubt and say it was really a political problem she faced. <laughs> She's tremendous. Please do not retire. Is it an intellectual problem, well, or is she just really trying to protect I, Hillary I from tell you, Bernie? I, I'm not going to accept that it was about Bernie, mm -hmm. because if you understand what a socialist is, and this is why I'm so aggravated by the whole thing at Debbie Wasserman Schultz, so many people in this country throw around the term with absolutely no idea what it means. There's nothing in this country that's social. Well, there actually are a few things that are socialist, yeah. but we're not certainly a socialist country. But, you know, she could have absolutely separated Bernie from a traditional right. socialist. He calls himself a democratic socialist. He is not actually in favor of government owning all industry, all means of production, all means of distribution of production. Mm -hmm. That's what a socialist is. And if you throw into there a one-party totalitarian government, socialism becomes communism. Right. That's the separation there. Was the Matthews so, answer right? The Matthews answer was a good shorthand answer, but it could have been better, in my opinion. Okay. But it was a good shorthand answer. Bernie is not really a pure socialist, not by a long shot. And so I don't know why Wasserman Schultz, you know, I think she just couldn't pull it together in her head. You, well, maybe you do a lot of TV, time. Heather. We all do a lot of TV, but you do a lot of TV. And when you, you're always very prepared. You, you got the nice notebook got there. Notes. It always has a thousand <laughs> bullet points. I, you know, I, I used to be the same way. Now, all that said, could you believe that she, three days later, knowing that was going to be the first well, question, right. still had the dolls all look on her face? That's the thing they don't understand. Because the way that she responded to the first question, you almost think it is an intellectual issue that yeah. she just couldn't come up with the answer. <laughs> but for the second time, Google. there would be some sort of preparation, whether you want to answer it or not. If, you, if it's a Bernie problem, if it's an intellectual problem, be prepared for the problem so that you're able to give it a cogent answer, even if people don't necessarily yeah. like it. Right. And that's just it. Yeah, and don't confuse over-regulation, if you believe that, mm -hmm. with socialism. And you know what? We're going to get a real good taste of this because I've seen tonight's comments. Oh. And yeah. you're going to get a great taste of how much Ooh, Americans so misunderstand. Sort of <laughs> you get 18 <laughs> seconds, Bill, to, to weigh in on this as well. Debbie Wasserman Schultz has always been crazy. She's been providing entertainment <laughs> for years. Mm -hmm. There should be nothing surprising about this comments. And yes, it is an intellectual problem. I'm not a big fan, but crazy is a bit of an overstatement. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Crazy for Kieran. That's, that's <laughs> what we should be talking about here. Anyway, was this political or does Debbie Wasserman Schultz, long name, really not know the answer? Go to NewsmaxTV.com slash comments. It's right there. And let us know. Coming up next, Americans do not like the Iran deal. This is The Daily Wrap only on Newsmax TV. And welcome back to The Daily Wrap. So a new NBC Wall Street Journal poll finds that opposition to the Iran nuclear deal has doubled since the question was last polled. Shortly before the deal was announced in June, 35% of the public now favor the agreement, while 33% are against it. The rest of those asked said they really didn't know enough about it to respond. Right after the nuclear deal was announced, 36% of the public approved it, 17% opposed it, 46% didn't know enough. So, while those in support have held their numbers, the undecideds are clearly going into the anti-column. Is this the result of an American public who, once they heard the terms of the deal, decided it just wasn't good enough? Or is this the result of opponents of the deal playing better politics than the supporters, Heather? I think it's definitely the, the prior statement that it's just not a good deal. The fact that, you know, Senator Cotton wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal today talking about the fact that the Iran, Irani Ayatollahs had access to all of these documents, all of the side deals, yet no one on the U.S. side has seen them. And there's no counter to that on the other side. Nobody is responding to that criticism. They're simply saying there's no better deal, which we've heard a lot of times, or that the risks of rejecting this deal is bigger than the benefits. Right, so what you're suggesting then are that those, particularly in opposition to it, are aware of the terms of 
of it and have judged it to be unworthy. Right, aware of what terms we are aware of. The fact that there are side deals in and of itself. But there's always, you know, this is, I gotta bring this up. When Ronald Reagan negotiated with Gorbachev and entered into the disarmament agreements with the Soviet right. Union, there were side deals there too. Why wasn't anybody complaining about it then? Because the entire procedure by which this has been done has been really, really so was that. secretive. So was that. And but to go around Congress and get the UN's approval before you get Congress's approval, the I don't think that any president has ever done first that. First of all, that, there's absolutely nothing secretive about that. I understand your point, and you can argue over it was good for him, bad for him, whatever, but it doesn't speak to the deal itself. And it also doesn't have any impact over whether or not our Congress ends up supporting the deal. So, well, I think it does have some impact. It also doesn't matter whether Congress supports it or not. Because because even, 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 if, even if a majority vote to disapprove it, one, the president's made it clear he's going to sign it no matter what. And two, well, no, there aren't enough clear he's going to veto it. Well, yeah, he'll veto their disapproval. Right. He'll sign the treaty, and it'll. Well, it'll wait, go it's not quite. You know, you're making it sound like he no. can just do that. Well, let's not. Let's well, be fair. No. He's going to veto it, and I think what you mean it's, to be saying is that they won't have enough votes to override his veto. No, they won't. That's have a enough. lot different I'm than sorry, them vetoing I, 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 it. You're right. You know, I was aping his arrogance about the treaty. Well, but okay. I, yeah. I apologize. Let's, you're right. let's keep it right. But they're not. They're not enough Democrats to to join for. Forces and override any. That's right. So this this is a this so is it will a be the deal. deal. That's right. a deal. So the poll also found that Democrats support the deal by a margin of fifty eight to eight, <laughs> while Republicans oppose the deal by a margin of sixty to fifteen. I'll come back to you, Heather. If it's not politics as usual, how do you explain those numbers? Well, I think a lot of it is politics as usual, but I think that you know I have to ask you, Rick. Is, does it not upset you that the Ayatollahs have seen this document, these side deals, and yet no one from the United States have seen well, it? Well, somebody has seen it. No, they, they, they were not. They were given no, the paper John, and then it was John taken away. John Kerry, I suspect, has seen not it, don't you? No, not according to the, the op-ed. Did you read the op-ed today? Oh, yeah, I did, but they I don't think that's it. what it said. They the, saw wait, 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 it, but then wait, wait, wait. it was taken then away. Then it's not a side deal. It's not a side deal if nobody on the other side is how it's. You, you're a lawyer. Side. You know there has to be a meeting of the minds. Between the between the um, the committee and the uh, Iranians, You mean between yes. the IAEA, yes. not between the United States. That's correct. Okay, I see what you're saying. That's correct. Uh, does that, that not bother you at all? Uh, it depends what's in it. And I... <laughs> and, and by the way, I, I don't think, sure. I don't sure think it it's true that it's John Kerry doesn't know what's in it. I just don't buy that. I don't know. I mean, listen, Congress should know what's in it. That's another story. And and Congress probably should know what's in that's it. I right. agree with that. But that's They're not what you're saying. You're saying that nobody in the American government knows what's in that. I don't buy that. I don't buy that John Kerry doesn't know. I don't buy that Moritz doesn't know. If Congress, Congress is voting may on not it, they should it. have the I, right to I'm with documents. you on that. I know actually. one person that knows. Who? Marie Hoff. <laughs> She's been involved with this from the top at the very beginning. And she will decide. Whatever happened to, to everybody's favorite co-ed uh, She's no longer a spokesman, so we don't freshman. get to see her on a daily basis. Yeah, you know? But she went off to do the negotiations, and she never came back. That's true. Well, she it is summer, and she's got to get ready for Pledge <laughs> Week, which starts only uh, right after Labor Day. So we got to look at it that way. You mentioned messaging before. And part of the messaging that's winning here, not so much from Republicans, right. but from the Ayatollah himself, when he's tweeting out, a picture of Obama committing right. suicide and saying basically, you know, it's a letter between E and G, you, uh, United States, yeah, we made a deal, but we're still going to continue to be bombastic right. and but death here's, America. Here's what I find Americans really, don't like to see that. No, they don't. I don't like to see it either. It's an but, end zone. But there's one thing that I do recall. Before we ever sat down to make this deal, the Ayatollah was already doing the death to America thing and, and destroy Israel and all that, and nobody complained, especially maybe, Mike Huckabee, Maybe people thought he'd who stop after for. the deal was done, though. After we're giving oh, him $100 billion, he's, he's got, like, still, he screw you. But he's got, who was doing that. he's got his political problems, too. He's got hardliners that don't want this deal more than you don't want this deal. And plus, no one can tell him from the last Ayatollah and the last Ayatollah. They all look the same, right? Uh, that's true. Ayatollahs have, well, all right. Well, we, we want to know what you think about the Iran deal, although, again, I have a pretty good idea I do know. We want you to weigh in at NewsmaxTV slash comments and let us know. Coming up next, we're going to read some of your viewer comments. That's how I know. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back to The Daily Wrap. Before we get to viewer comments and breaking news to share, as you know, there were efforts in the Senate and a vote today to defund Planned Parenthood. 
while Republicans did vote 53 to 46, or at least that was the vote 53 to 46, uh, 60 votes were needed in this case to defund Planned Parenthood. They come up seven short quickly. Rick, your, your thoughts on that? I'm not surprised at all. I didn't think they'd have enough votes to do it. Right, more of a so. symbolic move than anything else. Yeah, they probably didn't politics. know, but they could say, hey, we, we gave it a shot. And okay. there were going to be a lot of problems anyhow. There's a lot of conflicts with Medicaid. It goes on and on and on. Okay, so, so there you go. So let's go to our viewer comments. First, we have John with a comment about socialism. And the quote is, when the government taxes a company upwards of 50%, it is the majority owner. So yes, we are a socialist country. Rick, have fun with this one. <laughs> Considering big industry is monopolized by a very small amount of large public corporations, the government effectively does own the means of production. People frequently hop from corporate board positions to federal regulatory positions because there really is no difference. It's all the same company for all intents and purposes. Your reaction? So, John, I could write a book in response to your comments, but it gives us a great opportunity to make a few points. Uh, first of all, which government owns the uh, business? Because the federal government doesn't tax at 50 percent on corporate income taxes, so you're adding up all the taxes of federal, state, and local, I have to presume. My next question is, what about a company like GE who pays zero dollars in taxes the past couple of years? So now are you suggesting that we have a social socialist system for some corporations, but not a socialist system for other corporations? John, that's not the way it works. I pay taxes, but the government doesn't own my business. I know that because when I look at the corporate charter, which is sanctioned by the government, it says who does own the business. What you just said is that public shareholders own nothing. So I don't know how you square that one. And finally, the fact that somebody who might serve on a board might at a different time uh, also be somebody in the government. If you think that that is what creates socialism, you need to go back to high school, my friend. Okay. John, uh, continue to watch, please, and then ignore that last <laughs> utterly <laughs> patronizing comment from Unger. Well. Go back to high school. These it's are our true. viewers. They may be our viewers, nice. but I expect our viewers to do their homework. Okay. They're smart enough to watch us. They're smart enough to spend a half hour online really learning what it is. Okay. You're up next. Oh, I am. I just got carried away. Next, we have a comment <laughs> from <laughs> Teresa, who did not like our man on the street last week. Actually, it was a woman on the street last week. She writes, the Daily Wrap needs to stop promoting Obama's agenda and fantasy of a third term. Why encourage a man who has abused his executive powers to promote his socialist <laughs> agenda? Here we go. 2016 elections can't come soon enough. Uh, I know that the three of you will be very shocked to learn that you've been promoting Obama's agenda. Yeah, I didn't, I, who knew? I, I'm speechless and I'm really excited about the fact that I actually maybe have the ability to encourage him to entertain this fantasy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> last check, you can't run power. for a third yeah, term. Yeah, so far as I know, that's really not in the cards. But but I'm thrilled to hear that my, my partners in crime here on the set have now come to support the president and encourage his agenda. <laughs> <coughs> he would get the nomination. Uh, if you were to he, run he again. He might. It depends you know. who's running against him. Yep. And then as far as whoever the Republican is, I would gather that we're probably going to have a better candidate than a Romney or McCain, at least the way those uh, campaigns were run. So we'll it would, but we'll never see it. It's a hypothetical. Anyway, here is one from Kenneth, who is also not a fan of a third term for President Obama. Don't worry, Kenneth. Uh, no Obama 2016. He should be stripped of his U.S. passport, denied re-entry into America. Heather Hanson, will that happen to you when you go to Ireland later this year? <laughs> well, hey, where's he going? Let's hope not. I think that they think that he might leave, leave when, the his, country? Yeah, when yeah? his time oh, is done. When hmm. his time is done. But I think, you know, does that mean, does that bode poorly for Biden? You know, is Biden just a continuation of, of Obama? I think that that's... Well, that's that would be the argument be that would be made. a lot of Republicans would be saying, right. yes. Yeah. That, that's the argument. Unger? Oh, we have a fan of Dr. Ben Carson. I thought it was going to be me. It's not. It's Dr. No. Carson. Uh, Karen <laughs> says, I like what Dr. Carson said about Planned Parenthood the other night. They really shouldn't need government money as Obamacare is supposed to take care of these things. Karen. Obamacare is a payment system. It's an insurance system. Planned Parenthood, for better or for worse, depending on how you feel, is a provider of health care services. The two have nothing to do with each other. The closest they could come would be if somebody is on Medicaid, then they might have the opportunity to see a different kind of provider or you're doing the same thing other than Planned Parenthood. But you know what? In a lot of states, there was no expansion of Medicaid. So not everybody is covered. 
Okay, finally, one more question, and it comes from Victor, or common, I should say. Obama is the worst president ever. I used to think it was Jimmy Carter. Race relations are much worse than when he came into office. That's true. His policy of leading from behind now has our country no longer feared by our enemies and not trusted by our allies. Last word, Tucker. I have to agree with all I that. I was going to say, I don't totally agree with that that's email. It. It's nice to end on a positive note. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you agree he's the worst true. president ever. Okay. Remember, if you want to weigh in on any of these issues we talk about here in the show, be sure to go to Newsmax.com slash comments and let us know. Newsmaxtv.com and slash comments. Yes. <laughs> we might even read them on the air as we just did. It's time for yay or nay. That's next. because I think that he has set a very poor standard. He has done nothing for African Americans. They are worse now than just about ever. But, 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 but. And welcome back to Daily Wrap. Time for yay or nay. That was, of course, GOP frontrunner Donald Trump Sunday on ABC's This Week, talking about how President Obama has done nothing for the African-American community in this country. Mr. Trump says he would win the African-American vote as well as the Latino vote. Do you think Donald Trump will win the African-American vote? I think I'll go to Unger first well, on this we can, one. we can deal factually with the Latino vote because he's been telling us he's going to win it, and yet the poll mm -hmm. out today says 75% of Latinos can't stomach him. I am absolutely stunned by what he for, he said in that setup, that things are worse for African Americans today than ever. I would like him to get in his time machine that I'm sure the Donald can afford and go back to Jim Crow South, Mr. Uh, Trump. See well, how it was it, then. Did he say ever, ever or, or, or before, before, he took, before he took I office? I thought he said ever. I thought he said before he took can office. Can we replay that? Because I think he said ever. He said, said ever. ever? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I pay yeah, attention. I hate that's it when I have problem. to agree. And then you're going to tell me that terms. Trump speaks the truth. He says something outrageous. It's true. He well, talks you know from his heart. It's the the unemployment rate for blacks is hideous and horrendous and much worse than when he took office. You can make the arguments that, that the black community is much worse off than before he took office. I don't think there you are can numbers to support that. Yeah, yeah, I don't think you can say he's done. The numbers are not them. based on the I, president. I don't, the and numbers. I don't think you can say ever. I, I, I that's think, where you got me right. I think if Trump <laughs> hadn't said some negative thing about African Americans in the past, and if he could give give a way yeah. to improve that situation, then sure he could get the vote. Because people aren't voting about, they want their kids to have a better life than they have. Exactly. That's yep. what they're going to vote about. And, and yeah. what, what we're all missing here is that he already has the endorsement of a major African American figure. Yes, Dennis. Which one? Dennis Rodman. <laughs> and Dennis Rodman. Dennis no, Rodman. In that case, I take the back worm. everything I've said. Wisconsin Governor <laughs> Scott Walker just got a major donation from the Koch brothers while visiting a pizza shop in New Hampshire. It's huge, as you'll see. That is the governor holding a $900 million donation from the Kochs. Actually, none of this is true, of course. The check was part of a prank, and the governor had no idea what was going on. As you may recall, earlier this year, the Koch brothers promised to spend around $900 million of their own money on a campaign in order to influence the outcome. The prankers took advantage of this and asked the basically the governor to take a photo and right before it was shot they flipped it around and there you see that so it, it was craftily done I'll, I'll, I'll have to say so assuming the Koch brothers do end up giving their money to Governor Walker will it help him win the White House it's an interesting question of course money can't hurt right can't hurt yeah I mean, it can only help but they have a lot of power it's not just money and they go together but yeah I think that their backing will help whoever they give it to they're not going to back just one candidate though right Okay, there. they'll spread it around a yeah, little bit. Exactly. Uh, distribution of wealth. They'll, they'll, so to speak. Spread, they'll spread the love around a little. Not bit. to Trump. Okay. That's, they wouldn't not, even that's not a bet. That's not a bet you want to get wrong. Right. Not yeah. to Trump. Speaking of Trump, and Coulter wants to be President Donald Trump's Homeland Security Secretary <laughs> if that comes to fruition. Uh, Rick, I'm sure you have a lot of questions about this, one of which may be, is she even qualified? Well, according to outspoken conservative Ann Coulter herself, she can guess who the criminals are about 50% of the time. On the topic of immigration, Coulter said that we need to be tough like we were in the days of Ellis Island. Quote, we're assimilating you, you're here, you're going to be... An American, there will be no celebration of Cinco de Mato, there'll be no Ramadan, in fact, there won't even be a feast of the Immaculate Conception. We are an Anglo-Protestant country, and you will learn the Battle of Valley Forge. <laughs> 
Ann Coulter as Homeland hey, Security come on, Secretary. Who needs the Constitution? It's a big pain in the neck. Look, I mean, I'll tell you what, I am coming around to this. You know that I spent many years as a TV producer before yes. this. Mm -hmm. I want the rights, man. You have got the reality <laughs> show of all time. <laughs> Donald okay. Trump as president. Ann right. Coulter. Uh, what's her name okay. from Alaska? What a show. Sarah Palin. <laughs> what a show. tonight, the latest installment of Mission Impossible bought in about $121 million over the weekend, making it the highest opening weekend for its star Tom Cruise. Which brings me to my question. How long can the 53-year-old Tom Cruise look this young? I think I may have found Mr. Cruise's competition the same age demographic, however. Let's put him up. It's Spider-Man. Yeah. Who will play Spider-Man next? Unger, of course. Uh. He's looking good. All right, that's all for tonight. <laughs> Boy, you are looking quite jacked there, I have to say. It's not a Photoshop, we swear. <laughs> On behalf of Rick Unger, the best in the panel, I want to thank you for joining us. The Steve Malsberg Show, that's next. <laughs>